I wanted to do a video this week that is all about um, foreign films. I don't think that I've ever done anything about foreign films before here on this channel, and not to say that anyone will actually watch this, <laughs> but it is um, something that I'm very passionate about, film is, and sometimes I feel like foreign films get kind of pushed to the wayside because people don't want to read subtitles. Um, and when I say foreign films, I don't mean films that are made outside of the United States, which of course is where I live, but I'm thinking more in terms of the video of films that are in a non-English language. And there are so many wonderful ones. Just because I mentioned 10 specific ones here does not mean that those are the best ones or the only ones that you need to see by any means, but hopefully these films, once you see them, will open your eyes to the world of foreign film and help you or make you be just a little bit more open-minded towards them if it's something that you have a hard time with. I feel like shows um, like Game of Thrones and um, what's another one, uh, Killing Eve and a few other very popular shows tend to feature subtitles pretty heavily so therefore it isn't quite as foreign pun intended, to people as it may have been in the past. A lot of times people will shy away from anything foreign uh, as far as having to read subtitles, but I've noticed lately a lot of people keep their captions on when they're watching television shows anyway, so they're used to reading. And then also a lot of the more popular shows do tend to feature subtitles, so it's not as weird now to read as it used to be in film, if that makes any sense. I kind of have noticed a trend towards television shows using subtitles to, um, you know, for either a false language or a true language, in, and I think that that makes people more open-minded to them. Uh, another good example of that is... Um, like the Lord of the Rings trilogy or the Lord of the Rings movies usually had long sections of dialogue in Elvish, which of course is not even a real language, but people had no problem reading those. So I'm hoping that just having a list of foreign films maybe to start with will get you on board with them um, so that you're not quite as in a little capsule of what you're watching. Maybe you'll step outside your box. And there's a lot of things, a lot of classic films um, that I would love to feature on this channel, but I thought it might be kind of nice to devote an entire video just to foreign film. So the first one I'm going to talk about, and these are not in order. I do have my favorite, <laughs> but I'm, but they're not in order. Um, so I thought that maybe I would just start with the one that's at the top of my list, the first one I thought of. Um, the movie Diabolique is from 1955. It was directed by um, Henri Clouseau, and his wife, Vera Clouseau, is the main actress in the movie. It is a thriller. It is, I don't know if it's considered to be part of the film, film noir genre, but it is definitely a thriller. It has an extremely intense conclusion and climax to the film, and I definitely feel like it has set a standard as far as mood. It's very, very creepy, but it's also very engaging. Um, Simone Signore, uh, who was, I think, won an Oscar for Room at the Top. Um, she actually is in this film featured very, very strongly. It's basically a cast of three. Uh, the kind of cruel headmaster to a college or a school, his wife who is abused, and his mistress who conspires with his wife to kill him. And I'm not going to say more than that, um, but it is by all means a great movie and I do feel like all of these are 10 out of 10. Like that's the highest rating that I give a movie and I feel like that these are all 10 out of 10. So definitely give this one a chance. It's one of my all-time favorite thrillers. It's probably of all classic films, this is the movie, I even said this on Twitter recently, this is the movie that I would recommend to anyone who has never watched um, classic films in general. Um, because I feel like it's a great way to get on board and to see that classic films have set a standard and that there is a reason why some of these have stood the test of time. So the first one was Diabolique from 1955. Uh, it is a French film by director Henri-Georges Clouseau. Clouseau. Okay, so the next one that I wanted to talk about is actually a silent film. It's The Passion of Joan of Arc. If you've never heard of this movie, that's because it probably has never come up in conversation. It is not necessarily the most commonly known silent film. And it is directed by, um, I believe, Carl Dreyer, but I'm sure it's not pronounced Dreyer, it's probably Dreyer. Um, however, it contains one of the single greatest performances by a female ever. The movie is shot in a very, very ahead of its time, very 
disturbing quality of realism where most of the action on the screen is is head and shoulders. There's a lot of talking heads, there's a lot of pure emotion. And when it does, when the camera does pan away to other things, a lot of times they are abstract in nature so that it just is meant to give you a violent reaction, a reaction that is supposed to make you feel the sense of foreboding that Joan of Arc felt. The actress who portrays Joan of Arc is Renee Jean Falconetti, is how I think her name is pronounced, and it's sort of a landmark movie. It is definitely unlike anything you'll ever see. It is definitely difficult to get through in some ways. The reason I recommend it so wholeheartedly is because it will leave you feeling like no movie has ever let you feeling before. It is a feeling of raw emotion throughout. It is difficult to watch, but it is absolutely rewarding in the sense that you do feel that same peace that Joan of Arc likely felt when she truly did what she believed to be right. Um, the the direction is unequaled, it is free of makeup, free of any sort of, like, the lighting of course does play a presence in it, but it is free of any sort of like bells and whistles. It is really, really just about this raw performance and her eyes um, and just what she was going through at the time. It is not about her life up until the trials. It is about the trials. So it is not going to be one that is watched for fun. It is definitely a movie that is should be treasured and processed as you watch it. So I recommend watching it alone. Um, it is from 1928 and it is called The Passion of Joan of Arc. I believe it's La Passion de Jean d'Arc. I am horrible with the French accent. Don't ask me to do the French accent. I'm terrible at it. Um, and it is um, by Carl Dreyer, Carl Theodore Dreyer. Okay, the next one is Life is Beautiful. You have probably heard me talk about Life is Beautiful before. Life is Beautiful is from 1997. It is directed by Roberto Benigni, and he was starred in it as well and won the Oscar for it. It is one of the most phenomenal movies I've ever seen in my life. I am, my, it was life-changing for me. I absolutely adored it. It is difficult to watch because it does deal with the Holocaust. Um, however, it is a love story first and foremost, a love story between man and woman and a love story between mother and child and father and child. And because it is told in such a pure, and whimsical way, somehow the darkness of the concentration camps and everything that this family has to deal with is still, it still rings as a romance. And it's so odd to say that it's a romance set in a concentration camp, but um, it's not only a romance set there, but it's not, it's not only a love story set within a concentration camp, but it's a light-hearted love story within a concentration camp. The way that the father protects his son and the way that the, the mother and you know shows her love for her husband and son is just so, so beautiful. It's La Vita e Bella from 1997, um, Roberto Benigni. If you haven't seen this movie, please do not watch it dubbed. It is extremely important to me that no one watch these films dubbed. It takes away so much, so much from the power of the film and the way that it's put together. So it's just extremely important to me that we find ways to watch these foreign films without dubbing them. That's fine for kung fu movies. I love kung fu movies dubbed. It's great. Um, but I cannot understand or qualify watching a movie like Life is Beautiful with the dubbed English version. And that's all that's available on Netflix from what I've noticed. So I'm having a hard time finding it in Italian and it's frustrating for me. Without the Italian language, the movie suffers. It's, that's purely it. I don't mind reading subtitles, so I want to hear it in Italian. The next movie that I wanted to talk about is Raise the Red Lantern. And there are actually quite a few Asian films on this list, and I think it's because there are so many brilliant Asian filmmakers. Um, there are two specifically that I obsess over, and so the first one is Zhang Yimou. Um, he is the director of uh, a few movies that I absolutely love. I'm going to get into those later. But this movie, Raise the Red Lantern, is one of the most monumentally beautiful of his movies. I feel like that it makes the most impact because of the stark whites with all the bright colors and that's hard to explain until you actually see it. But it is um, from 1991 and it's absolutely beautifully filmed. It's a period drama. It is considered to be quintessential Chinese film, uh, cinema. 
Raise the Lan Red Lantern stars primarily Gong Li, who plays a beautiful young woman who is to become the wife of a very, very large, powerful, of a very powerful landowner. And um, she is going to be his fourth wife, and she is initially very thrilled until she starts to develop, see the dynamic between the wives and he at his home. Um, it becomes a tragic and very engaging story. There is so much, so many nuances in this story that it's impossible for me to try to encapsulate it all in just a couple of minutes, but it is extremely, extremely good. Um, the, lo the, the, the loving way in which this is filmed, the way that the camera plays on the faces of the different women, and the way that it just basically encapsulates, I mean, the lanterns themselves are historically beautiful in filmmaking and it's something that I feel like is sort of a master class of filmmaking so it's basically the story of a landowner and his wives that is it but it is a very dramatic story and it is a gorgeous gorgeous movie so Raise the Red Lantern by Zheng Yimou. Another film by Zheng Yimou that is from 19... Um, let's see when did it come out I'm gonna actually look this one up because I couldn't remember 19... oh 2000 it came out in 2000 I saw this movie when I was pregnant with my first child. It actually must have come out in 1999 because my son was born in January of two or February of 2000, so I know it did not come out in 2000. But anyway, saw when I was pregnant. Sobbed, <laughs> sobbed the whole movie. And that seems to think that it's a sad movie, but it's really not. It's just a beautiful, beautiful, simple love story. And it stars uh, Zhang Zhi or Zhi Zhang, whatever her name is. She's the girl that was this be the beautiful little like nymph-looking woman that the actress that's in. I think she's in Rush Hour, and she's in um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and she's in um, trying to think of some other things she was in. Oh, the um, House of Flying Daggers, a few others. She's just so, so beautiful. She looks like a doll, and she was in so many movies at this time period, if you'll remember. Uh, but this was my favorite. This is a phenomenal movie. It's gorgeous all the way through, and the thing that it makes it so wonderful is that it's the telling of how a man and a woman, how it starts with a man's father's funeral, and, and with the importance of bringing his father's body um, many miles to a specific resting place and why it's so important that it travel this road and be buried in this specific resting place is because of the manner in which his parents met. And so the entire story is told basically in flashback and will stay with you forever. It is beautiful. So definitely give The Road Home a watch. Um, it is easy to watch for a foreign film because there is not very much dialogue, so keep that in mind as well. The same with The Passion of Joan of Arc. It's a silent film, so you're going to see subtitles in both French and English, and it's easy to watch because there is so little dialogue. Uh, this is a perfect example of that as well, and it's one of my all-time favorite love stories. I didn't realize that I had three of his movies on here, but this is another Zhang Yuma movie, um, and it's Hero, and you may have seen Hero. Hero was actually released in, I think, 2004, and it starred Jet Li. And I had never seen any of Jet Li's movies before, and I also was not as enamored with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, even though it's a beautiful movie and it's extremely well done, as, for instance, The Academy was. Um, but Hero, to me, was an even better movie, um, and it is basically a very, very, uh, almost like a fantastical tale. It contains a lot of gorgeous fight scenes throughout, but they're all color-coordinated in this sense. I think it's very similar to something that Kurosawa would have done. Well, like combination of color and action, um, basically a, one story being told by one character is being told from several different perspectives, and the different perspectives that it's being told from, each tableau is told with a different color scheme, and somehow that just makes it even more like a fairy tale. And it is somewhat a fairy tale. It's got some very tragic moments, it always makes me cry, but it also just stuns me every time I see it because of how beautiful it is. So even though I know there's three of his movies on here, they're all three very different movies, and so I feel like he's such a well-rounded, beautifully, um, like nuanced director that I think you should definitely watch all three. But if you're going to watch just one of them, pick the one that you feel like suits you the most. If you're into love stories though, definitely go with The Road Home over this one. If you like more fantasy, then definitely go with Hero. The next one is my only Kurosawa film on this list. Kurosawa is known for his movies like Seven Samurai, um, Rashomon, Akira. These are movies that are all very different, but also 
are involve specific types of characters. Um, High and Low, however, is my favorite of his movies, and it is actually one of my all-time favorite movies. I'm looking up the year it came out right now because I can't remember to save my life. Um, it came out in 1963, and it is set in the present day for that time period. It is about a very wealthy man who is faced with an extremely difficult decision. His son is kidnapped, and as the crook is calling, um, or as the kidnapper calls to demand the ransom, his son comes running in the room. And he is thrilled and happy and overwhelmed because he thought for a moment his life was over. But then he realizes that the kidnapper mistakenly kidnapped his driver's son, so his servant's son. And he has to decide whether he will potentially ruin himself by paying the ransom for the son of his driver. It is extraordinarily well done, beautifully told. The direction is fantastic. I mean, this is an example of Akira Kurosawa at his best. I remember there's one sequence that I will never forget where one of the key char characters is walking through like the underworld of Tokyo. And you can actually, the soundtrack to this scene is like the labored breathing of these people, these drug addicts and all these people around. It is so disturbing and it was just so well done. So it is definitely one of my all-time favorite movies. I feel like I need to go watch it again since it's been several years since I've seen it. But High and Low is to me Akira Kurosawa's masterpiece and I would love to see more people know about it and hear about it. Just watching, looking at through here for the years that these movies have come out, I've noticed that they all have like 90-something percent on Rotten Tomatoes. That makes me feel good. Babette's Feast is from 1988. This is a Nordisk film. It is actually told... Um, I can't remember what the language is that it's in. I feel like it's, um, I feel like it's spoken in, like, Swedish, maybe? The director is Gabriel Axel. And it is about very simple, it's a very simple story. These two ladies are single and very happy and content with their lives. And they take in a French lady to be their cook. And they find out quite quickly um, that she has come into an inheritance and she wants to give them a feast, make them a feast, unlike anything they've ever tried. And being the kind of women that really value simple things and value simplicity, um, they're hesitant at first to permit her to do this but she insists upon it. And it is a beautiful story. It actually has a backstory that deals with the two sisters that is just extremely thrilling and fun, um, exciting, beautiful little love stories. But the story of the, the, the mysterious French woman who they take in and who becomes their cook, it develops over the course of the movie at the same time as this meal she's creating develops. And that in itself is what makes this so fantastic. So the the movie will make you hungry, there's no doubt, but it is a phenomenal movie. Even my little girl watched it, and she wasn't old enough at the time to read it. Um, so it's probably a few years ago then, because she's eight now, so obviously quite a few years ago that we watched it. But it's such an engaging story, and the acting is so compelling, and the story and the meal that plays out is so, so thrilling that that's why, she was, that's why it's, it's a movie that, that even she appreciated and enjoyed. The, the best thing about it is the reactions of these simple people to these fantastic dishes. It's, like, it's really wonderful. Okay, and so there's two more. Uh, the next one is Amélie. Amélie is from 2001, and it is directed by Jean-Pierre Junet, which I am not sure what else he has directed. I'm going to have to look it up, but it stars Audrey Tatou. Most people have seen Amélie. Um, there are so many people that watched Amélie that would never otherwise have given foreign films a chance just based on word of mouth. You may be one of those people, but Amélie is a wonderful love story about a wonderful girl, a girl who has a hard time connecting with people but loves to make other people happy. And it is um, just beautifully, beautifully told, beautifully done. And it is something that you can go back and watch over and over again because it gives you such a great feeling of happiness at the end. It's a French film and it's, um, again, an easy one to find. So hopefully um, you give Amélie a chance if you haven't yet. I almost feel silly talking about that one much because most people have seen that one. And if you have watched any foreign films, it's probably the one you've seen. And the last one I wanted to talk about is Rafifi. I'm not going to talk much about this because I feel like Rafifi is one that you you can easily spoil it by saying too much. But Rafifi is a 1956 
perfect example of film noir. It is a crime drama, it's about a heist, and it is directed by Jules Dassin. I do not know what else he has done, but it's a fantastic, fantastic heist movie that has long sections of silence that only, only deal with the actual action on the screen and that really heightens the suspense. So if you're a fan of film noir or even if you've seen film noir and haven't really been blown away by anything yet, I personally am not a double indemnity fan. Um, there are quite a few that in the asphalt jungle I didn't care much for. I feel like, and even Laura, not a big fan of Laura, I, I feel like the, the, the movies that are considered to be perfect examples of film noir very rarely impress me. But this one was definitely one that I felt like was impressive and stayed with me much better than any of the American film noir that I've seen. So hopefully this was helpful to some of you that might be, maybe were considering watching uh, some foreign movies and reaching out. And hopefully that some of you will give these movies a chance. And I am going to get back to my YouTube I'm going to get back to my YouTube favorites next week, but I thought that this, I would make this my second video for the week just because I felt like it needed to be said. And I will talk to you later.